jump on here and um, welcome everyone to Spoken History tonight. I'm going to take care of a couple housekeeping things. Um, this will be live streamed to YouTube tonight. So um, if you um, know of a friend or somebody who missed it tonight and wants to watch it at a later time, um, they can find it on our YouTube channel. So that is happening. Um, and for those of you who are, who are online, um, if you have questions for our speaker tonight, you can type them in the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. And I will um, find an opportune time to interrupt him and ask those questions for you, or we'll get them at the end of the presentation, if that's the case. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's coming in online. And we have a group in the Felker Room, too, in person. So if you are looking for Marshfield's spoken history, you are in the right place tonight. Um, we have a speaker here, John Berg, and he's going to be talking about how the early settlers of Marshfield relied on blacksmith skills uh, for their everyday life. And um, we're very fortunate to have him here. Mr. John Berg um, was born in Wisconsin Rapids and raised in the village of Port Edwards, uh, which are both Southern Wood County um, places in Wisconsin. Um, he was a teacher from 1979 through 2012 in the Wisconsin Rapids Public Schools, and he retired in June of uh, 2012 after 34 and a half years as a special education teacher. Um, in May of 1987, uh, Mr. Berg graduated with a Master of Science degree um, in teaching history from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point and majoring in United States and Canadian history with an emphasis on the colonial fur trade frontier. And in January of 1988, he was admitted to the University of Minnesota graduate program for the Master of Arts in History. Um, and as a prerequisite to admission, admission to earn the PhD um, in history, among his other interests um, is that of Wisconsin's lumber and railroad industries and labor history. His interest in history has led him to hobbies of operating his own coal-fired blacksmith and shooting and hunting with muzzle-loading flintlock rifles. So would everyone please welcome uh, Mr. John Berg tonight. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So as most of you know, the blacksmith, we were just talking about this before we started, but uh, every town that was settled and every uh, just about every lumber camp that was a, a constructed camp in the woods, farms had a blacksmith shop because you had a horse culture. Your transportation was horse and later steam. Uh, your wagons, everything that you had that was your equipment was made out of iron or steel and had to be fixed. I mean, wagons were made out of wood and so on, but you had all the iron wheels and connections and everything. So a blacksmith was the person who could work with that and, and actually uh, repair it or make it for you. Now, uh, blacksmith comes from the term black meaning iron, which is the black metal, and smith is an old English word from smite. So you smited the black metal. And, uh, and so blacksmith was the, was the colloquial that that became. Um, as we look here, the, the, the main emphasis that we're gonna look at tonight is really no, if I can get much yeah, you don't, yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties solved. Um, as our as our slide here shows that we're going to go from 1872 to 1974 in Marshfield itself. Um, the big issue here is the railroad. And it was the Wisconsin Central that built through in the 1870s coming up from Menasha, and the mission was to build to Ashland twofold. One was uh, the Canadian government was sympathetic to the South during the, the Civil War, and uh, to secure the border, it was needed, it was necessary to have rail traffic in case there was any further conflict. And the other one was, of course, the immense uh, timber and mineral resources of the North Woods. And once the Indian treaties were settled in the 1850s, uh, that really pushed the natives, uh, Native Americans onto the reservations or tried to force them onto the reservations and opened up the uh, lands for logging and mining interests. So the course of empire was the Wisconsin Central Railroad. And of course it went up the, uh, through Auburndale and cut up through what was Marshfield. This map from 1878 shows the settlement of Marshfield uh, in the Northern part of Wood County. The uh, settlement of Wooster was the end of the line in 1873. This is Wooster, it's just North of Prentice, about two miles 
The reason I throw this picture in is um, this is kind of what your typical railhead looked like in the 1870s. Log homes, uh, log warehouses for the, for the lumberjacks and everything. Uh, and so Marshfield in its infancy perhaps looked, we know that we have the picture of, uh, of the first log home that was built here by Louis Rivers. But when, as these buildings went up, you were using uh, materials that you had and logs were the primary. So Marshfield may have looked somewhat like Wooster did in the 1870s. Uh, this plan of Marshfield is from 1875. Uh, the railroad depot grounds are in, in defined and everything. And you also have some of the blocks defined here, the public park and so on. And the cluster around the uh, Central Avenue is where we're going to focus on with the early Marshfield blacksmiths. Now, these pictures you have in a lot of your Marshfield history books, and I, I got these from, I scanned these from the collection of Northwood County Historical Society. And here you have Upham's Mill, which was uh, 1878, I believe. And uh, his building, oh, oh. Yeah, you can see the Uh, he messed around a little bit with uh, speculating in some lots. And I found that with kind of a pattern here. My great grandfather did, he did, John Cole did. Um, and so they, they messed around with buying up some lots on speculation, just as an aside to, to generate some. Yep. Homes. Well, I don't know about that, Shelby. Um, I, I think just to invest in the lot and then resell it at a higher price. Okay. You know, they got in on the ground floor and so they were able to buy the lot, say you buy a lot for $200 and you may be able to hold on to it for a year or two and sell it for three, you know, so you could generate some income that way. I know that my great grandfather bought some lots in Millador and in Hewitt, which I didn't know about, but that was speculation because he never opened up shops. You know, there weren't branch divisions of the Bird Blacksmith shop. It was just speculation on the settlement of those, of those villages. Yeah. Don, okay, so yeah, here we are at Marshfield, and I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking this dates from 1879, 1880, somewhere in there, is that, that pretty reasonable? Uh, and so, you know, you've got uh, these businesses that have been established, and, and within uh, eight years of the railroad coming through, um, you've got a pretty good downtown established, and you can see, of course, with the fire, <laughs> everything's wood, that was another question I asked the third graders, why did it burn so good? <laughs> wood and wind so all right we can go to the next one Don. this is Romanoff's is this the one you were thinking of yeah. no okay this is Romanoff's hardware store again in that same block area uh, dating from 1884 one of the more elaborate buildings uh let's go to the next one okay now this is John Habig's shop that he purchased uh again from the Marshfield uh, Northwood County collection and uh, he said that he came to town in the spring of 1878 and he purchased a shop and, that do and the dwelling across the road and began his practice. This picture actually we'll talk about later, but this is a picture that was taken later. And this is my great grandfather who bought the shop from him in 1883. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, here's the maps that I wanna get at. Uh, so here is Central Avenue, 100 feet wide. And the depot is up here, up in this area here. This is the site of the Thomas House right here, to orient you a little bit. And uh, this would be over by uh, the police station, I believe is in here. And uh, Scotty's Pizza is in here. And Cole's, Cole's Machine Shop is in here. Well, the green buildings here, this one is John Habig's first shop. And right here is uh, 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 Simon Flom's harness, harness shop right next to each other and there's a back building here if you want to back up to that other picture the first picture don um okay right here you can see this building in the background here that shows up on the map and right here is simon flum's harness shop right next to it so we can go ahead to the map and so this is Habig's first shop and his dwelling is right here the dwelling that he bought is right across the street 
And then over here is John Cole's shop. And Cole came in the spring of 1879. And he, uh, in his documents, it states that he was supposed to, within six months, build a substantial building and they get the dimensions of it and start a business thereon. So he and uh, Bernard from, they were from Washington County. They came up here and built this shop. And I think this dwelling here was his house, but he had these outbuildings here too. So those are your, those, and then why did, okay, this is Habig. And uh, so it's Habig and Cole for the first uh, couple of years that are, are blacksmithing. And then over here off the map, you have Upham's Mill. And I'm presuming that he had a mill right in a blacksmith shop associated with that. Although Cole did, both Cole and Habig did quite a bit of work for Upham, building wagons and sleighs uh, for the logging and the hauling. So. Okay, Don, we can go to the next one. Uh, this is John Habig's uh, family. This is John and Barbara Dressler Habig. Uh, he was born in 1838 in uh, Baden, Germany. And uh, he did quite an extensive, they had in Europe, they had a very extensive uh, apprenticeship program. And he spent his formative years as an apprentice and then he traveled around Europe working in different shops. Uh, by the time he came here in the 1860s, he had met Barbara in New York. And they were married out there. And then they uh, went to Oshkosh in 68. And they were in Ma uh, Menasha until the spring of 1878 when they purchased an old shop and moved their family into a log building across the street. Okay. So going back to this shop again, uh, just to, to reiterate on that, um, that he is quote in his recollections were purchasing an old shop. He began business as a blacksmith the first time he ever conducted business on his own account in this country. He's always working for somebody else. The old shop was located in uh, lot eight. Lot eight of block H. I'm sorry, when I did this, I <laughs> it didn't have the lot, but it was lot eight of block H. And uh, the, uh, I haven't identified the original owner. And again, this is Mike Berg standing in front of the shop after it was sold. Okay. So here's uh, next one. This is now picture this, and we'll go to the next slide. Here we go. Sure, we will. My grandparents rented, like I said, from the Hebrew, but he owned several houses in the one and two hundred block house of uh, down there. That was probably his son. Yeah. That's what I'm yep, this is the correct one. This is the site of, of Habig's first shop. So what you just saw, this is where, where it is. I was up here in April and, or in May on a rainy day and decided to take pictures of the show. Uh, this building was built by, I said, Michael Bast. Um, it wasn't, it was uh, A. Bast. I think it was Anton Bast in June of, 18, after the June 1887 fire. So. All right. Again, just a little shot, a little bit further back of it. Okay. So after John Habig, uh, is that right? Yeah. After John Habig built or sold his shop, he built up where Bay's Bar is or was, Bay's, Bay's, Bay's Bar up on the north side. And this is the shop that he built. Now, these slides are showing larger than what I had them, but that's, we're gonna have to just do what we can here. Uh, this shop was his until he died in 1918. And uh, I do not know what happened to it after that. But this is John Habig here. And I'm not, these two guys are unidentified. One of them might be his son. Okay. Next on the block, can we move this? Okay. Okay. Uh, is it possible to click on that and move it down to the corner? Yeah. Just like in school. Bird, you sit over here. All right. This is John and uh, his wife, uh, Johanna. No, Susanna. Susanna. Susanna Cole. John and Susanna Cole. 
And uh, they came in 1879 and he had to agree to erect the building. Uh, excuse me, in 1878, he came here and before February of 1879, he had to erect a building uh, of a value of not less than $150. So he was uh, uh, a blacksmith, of course, the uh, Marshfield Times, January 3rd, 1881, recorded that Albert Flamel, who was a blacksmith working for John Cole, broke his arm while trying to shoe a horse, so we know that he was in business. Um, and then he worked until 1900, and uh, he retired due to ill health. He was born in 1853, and he died in 1904, and his wife died in 19... They were in 19... 20, and of course, Cole's shop is up here. Now, after the fire, he moved further down on Central Avenue and uh, he built a more substantial shop down there. Okay. So, the next one up are, are Mike and Johanna Schoenhofen Berg. And uh, Mike Berg uh, came over from the uh, area around uh, Trier on the Mosul River uh, in 1849. He was born in September of 1849, and uh, they arrived uh, in November of 1850 is when they came over. And uh, he was raised in a little place called Ashford, which is south of Fond du Lac, about 15 miles. It's just east of La Myra. They had a uh, farmstead there in 1871. He picked up with the neighbors and went down to Southeast Kansas married the neighbor girl, Anna Maria Hall, and they had four daughters, and uh, two of them survived, uh, two did not. The last one uh, died in childbirth along with uh, his first wife, Anna Maria. He came back up to the Ashford area, and he either met or knew of Johanna. Shane Hopkins were from uh, the Ashford area also, and they got married in 1880, and they went back down to Kansas, uh, they had two more sons down there, John Martin and Peter William, and or two more children, uh, sons Peter and, and John Martin, and then they came to Marshfield in December of 1883. Okay. And so this is the uh, hay big shop again, together with the buildings there on the southerly half of Lot 8, Block H, for $2,400. Want to go ahead, Don, for this one? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Now, down in Kansas, they had a farmstead. Mike and, and, and Anna Maria and then Johanna came into the scene. They had a farmstead down there, and, a, and it was a fairly big one. And so it's my understanding that he sold that land and made a pretty good profit from it. He was also blacksmithing down there. I don't know where Mike learned blacksmithing, whether it was at Ashford or down in Kansas. But by the time he gets here, obviously, that's what he's doing. And uh, so this is the shop, the old shop that was sold to him before it was consumed in the June 1887 fire. All right, we can go to the next. And here's what Marshfield looked like after that. Again, you get a kind of a feel for it. Um, looking at the absolute, they call it a Holocaust. The newspaper said Holocaust. Okay, Don. Okay, so then what happens is that uh, Marshfield, now this is where I'm gonna rely on, on you Marshfield people all now, but Marshfield enacted uh, what I call the fire district. And, and I think it was down past third or fourth, man, I think it was fourth. It was down to fourth Avenue. Everything had to have a brick facade on it. And it had to be constructed to new standards because they were trying to avoid the problem that you saw in earlier Marshfield where it was all wood, wind and wood. So Mike moves down to between fourth and fifth and builds a two-story wood blacksmith shop because he was only partially insured. And uh, so he took out a mortgage and uh, go ahead, Don. This is the shop that he built. Uh, lots nine and 10 for $1,050 from Simon Canorier in block 94. And um, by, he took out a mortgage and then uh, this photograph was taken between 1891 and 1900. Uh, this is Mike Berg here. And uh, his blacksmith over here and here are not identified. We thought at one time that this might've been Joe Goldbach, uh, which would put this at 1895 because that's when Goldbach came to town. 
This is believed to be uh, Charles Poor's. Um, yeah, he was he was Mike's attorney and so on. Um, and uh, so this is the shop that was built in 1887, September 1887, and it shows up on the Sanborn map that you just saw. And uh, as we'll see, it, it grows with different things, with different activities and that. Um, so this, this shop uh, in 1919, Mike entered in a party wall agreement with Walt Miner. Walt Miner wanted to build a cement block uh, brick facade car garage. And it's a two story building and it's still there. It's right across from the theater. Uh, this shop is where the Alexia nightclub is now. And uh, so go ahead, Don. Right here, this is again, uh, 1891. Now you can see the blacksmith shop here. And then he's also got a woodworking shop going on down here. And this later on is where Walt Miner built that shop that's still there, the big, the big brick building. So, okay. Now this picture is really kind of a neat picture. And I don't know if you can see it very well. I tried to enhance it a little bit when I scanned it, but this is taken from the Washington School and it's looking up Central Avenue. And here's Mike's shop right here. And then right next to it, back tucked back in here is his, is his woodworking shop. So this is Mike's shop here. And you can tell because it's got the three windows across the top. It's got the open doors down here. And then it's got the windows, the false front and the uh, gable roof. Is that a smokestack there? Off to the left from the little doorway right there? Is that a smokestack? This, this might be, but I'm not sure. This is Upham's mill and his flour mill and everything and his water tower. And his sawmills back here. What's fun to do with this is to look at this. You, you can kind of date these photographs by looking at this and then looking at the 1891, 18, you know, these, these Sanborn maps to see what's in there. And uh, like this is this building right here on the corner, if this is the corner here. This building right here or somewhere in here was a general store. And I'm thinking this, but I might be wrong. I'm just kind of guessing as, oh no, maybe it's here. This is the general store right here. Yeah, here's the block right here. So this is a general store and here on this map, again, in the 1891, it says general store. So if you can identify where the blocks start, and this is my shop, you come up, here's the block right here for Fifth Street. And then you look at the map, here's a general store and you can tell what's in, in between there. So if you're doing family history, you know, it's a lot of fun. You can start pinpointing things. Hey, uh, Don, let's go on. Uh, okay, January 1898. Now here you see the blacksmith shop again. And now you got the wood shop with a wood shed back here. Uh, now you have a steam carpenter shop, which is next to, this is where Walt Miner's building ended up. But in 1898, there was a steam carpenter shop there. And you have another blacksmith shop down here. And I think this is John Cole's blacksmith shop. Okay. These are some ads that ran in the early 1900s. This is from 1904. And uh, so he made an ad, you know, a lot of times it's word of mouth, but you can draw more business as more Smiths are coming. So you can go to whoever you want. Okay. Uh, this map is from June of 1904. And again, here's the shop. Here's the woodworking shop, the shed. There's some more outbuildings here. And then over here, this eventually was was Fred, uh, was it Fred Olson? Fred, it was Fred Olson's blacksmith shop, which eventually got sold to the Jersey Brothers. And later on, Joe Goldbach was working for Mike Berg in 1895. And then when he started his shop, he went over here into the alleyway and put up a shop too, which we'll see in a few minutes. Now here's another nice picture, and these are what's cool is you go up here and you see these pictures, you know, and you're always hoping, you know, what, what did the shop look like? Well, if we go back to the, if we go back to the 19, don't we won't go back, Don, but when we look at the 1904 uh, map, you can start seeing some of the things that were in here, and you can kind of figure out where this was. This is on the corner um, right here. In here would be where the uh, restaurant was. Uh, or still is the family restaurant that's not in business anymore. That's right in here. Here's Mike's shop right here. Right in there is Mike's shop. And they're laying cement up there. So 
And we know that this is after 1903 because this is Connor's building right here. So that's another way you can date that. You know, if you know when some of these buildings came in. Their building, Connor's yep. was by Walking Yep, and that's what 1911. Is it? Yeah. Okay, so there you go. Now, if you know that kind of stuff, all of a sudden now, now we know, you know, there's a telephone pole here too. Those are the aspects of Marshfield history that I'm not familiar with that I'm relying on you guys for. Okay, Don, let's go to the next one. Now here's roughly the same or similar, close to the same scene. Here's Walt Miner's building. Here's where Mike's shop was. I'm up closer, actually. I'm a block closer than what that photograph was, but it kind of gives you an idea. The Connor building, I think, sat right here. Big series stories, or the low. Yep, yeah, that one there, and now it's moved around the corner. Now, another one, you know, there were several of these. The, the Wisconsin Blue Book of 19, well, roughly from 1900 to 1910, lists 14 metal related trades in Marshfield. And they had like a half dozen blacksmiths, and the rest were sheet metal. Uh, you had um, some machine shops, you had things with the mill, but there were that many trades just related to metal work in Marshfield. And of course, a lot of these houses, the houses like Mansion House and so on, they ran, a, they were next to a livery stable because you came in off this train and if you were going to get a horse and buggy and go somewhere, you know, you could go right there. It's like rent a car, rent a buggy. And uh, oftentimes these would have a blacksmith or a farrier who would take care of your horses and buggies and so on. Uh, again, this is Marshfield in 1912 Sanborn map. And, and I, I have to apologize that most of this focus is on the birds because that's who I am. And uh, our, our family story is that after the fire, the birds single-handedly rebuilt Marshfield. So, you know, we got all this stuff. Going. <laughs> Nobody believes that. Is it? So anyway, it's kind of from the birds outward and that I apologize for that. But uh, again, here we have, uh, Right here is Mike's blacksmith shop now in 1912. So that picture that you just saw of them laying cement, that's about the same time as this map here. And you can identify some of these buildings. The woodworking shop is tucked in here. And then over here, you have Fred Olson's blacksmith shop, which by this time was sold to the Jersey brothers. And they ran this by, and here's Joe Goldback's blacksmith shop right in here, tucked in the alley here. Here's the monuments, which is still there, Marshfield Monuments. Um, General store down here, I think, is this Krabby Dave's? I think it's Krabby Dave's, right? Yes, Gustafson's, okay. And saloons and so on. So um, over here is a feed store. And then here is Connor's office building. So you can see the makeup now is, is changing. So in a two block area, you've got three Smiths. And then Cole's old shop down here, um, I think that was repurposed into. Uh, Eventually, gets the autos. Yeah, there was it's the automobiles coming, and then you see that transition. Okay, Don. Here's Joe Goldbach's shop. This is Joe Goldbach right here, and uh, I dated this from 1904 to 1912 in that era. Born in Milwaukee in uh, 1870, he apprenticed in blacksmith's trade in the city down there. Then he went to Chicago for seven years, and uh, he married Catherine Thurman down there. Then in 1895, in the spring, he and Catherine moved to Marshfield, where he started working for my great-grandpa, Mike Berg, around 1900, somewhere in there. I don't have it. I, I'm assuming, and I haven't had the time to go back and do the research, but I'm guessing that these dates will be found in the Marshfield newspaper somewhere. Because usually they would announce, you know, like they did with Mike Bird buying John Habig's shop, that kind of thing. And he served as three terms for Marshfield Mayor in the 1920s. But this is his little shop that was tucked in right now. Right there. It was very attractive, very nice. Well, uh, they painted this, I'm assuming that it was painted on, you know, it's. I, it may be stucco, it may be, you know, sealed up. But, 
Yeah, this up here. Yeah, this is all cement or uh, brick. 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 Yeah. yeah, brick. That's very pretty and very distinctive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, said that this was actually built back in the alley. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's try. It. Okay, now this is the Thompson Canoe Thompson's blacksmith shop on Fourth Street, and uh, there's some familiar names in here. I know this one, Mose Lupient. That's a name that is an old Marshfield name right here. He was born in 1873. We're we're related by marriage to the Lupians because my, uh, let's see, Mike's son, John Martin, married Rose Steinmetz. And Julia Steinmetz married Mose Lupian. So that's the tie-in there. And uh, so this is Mose. This is, I think, taken around 1900 or Maybe in the 1890s. This is Knud Thompson, Mike Vincent, Moses Lupient, Dan Sheehan. The child is not identified, but maybe his child. Joe Vincent's got the horse. Uh, Nick Kauth is standing here. Tom Thompson, I think, is Knud's brother. And then this is Furstenberg, and I'm, I don't know if they may both be Furstenbergs. This one is identified as Furstenberg. It's not known which one. We had a restaurant at a hotel just up the road on Central. Okay. Farmer's home was his. And so if this is on fourth, he was just up the road a little bit. Slays, you know, you can see what they're building, slays and so on. Uh, you saw that in the, the Hay Big Bird blacksmith shop. You had slays, you had wagons, sulkies. Mike was building sulky plows, and uh, sulky plows are with a seat on them. You can ride them. And you can have a two bottom, four bottom, is usually the common. Okay. Again, some ads. R.K. Sullivan, located at the Canood Thompson shop. So Sullivan was in that shop. That was in 1903, 1904. You got Sullivan and O'Connor on uh, Chestnut Street. All right, we can go on from there. And this is the original folder uh, photograph with the names written in. I just show for reference there. Okay, now this is Tremel's Corner. And uh, Joseph Tremel uh, built up quite a business down on that corner. And I think that was on the south part of town. It's down 14th. by 14th, yeah, down in that area. And uh, so the, um, uh, the blacksmith, let's go to the next slide once. I think I've got all this on there. Okay, yeah, Mike Curie. Was the blacksmith down here on Tremel's Corner? His ad in the 1903 uh, or 04 paper. So there was a blacksmith down there. He, really, he advertised himself as the old, reliable, horseshoe blacksmith and weight. And then back, okay. So Joseph Tremel, born in 1856 in Bavaria. They immigrate to Menasha in 1858, age 24. Joseph goes to Milwaukee. Uh, 1883, he marries Gertrude Geschel. They had three boys. 1884, he's in Marshfield, builds a cheese factory. Uh, Gertrude died in 1888. In 1889, he marries Margaret Ott Kick. They had three daughters. 1891, he sold the factory. 1894 or 1890, he builds a home, store, and saloon. In 1895, he's proprietor of a hotel, stockholder in a bedding and chair factories and dealt extensively in real estate. Okay, more. So I don't have a picture of Thierry's blacksmith shop. That's the closest thing I can show you is, you know, what was going on in that corner. Now we jump ahead to 1925 on this map. And uh, here's Mike's blacksmith shop. And this is marked as S, which is shop. Okay, or store. And this was his wagon making shop and his, his outbuildings there. Here is Walt Miner's building that was built in 1919. When you go over, you look at that building now, it says 1920 in the date block up there. And then over here, you have the Jersley brothers and you have Joel Goldbach's blacksmith shop. Okay. Here's Mike Berg's family. 
uh, Mike and Johanna. Now his two daughters, uh, Anna Maria, or yeah, Anna Paul Berg, the daughter, came with him to Marshfield, of course, uh, him and Johanna. These two boys were born in Kansas. The rest were born in Marshfield. Uh, but Anna Maria and Petronella were also part of that family and they came to Marshfield. And uh, Anna Maria, or Anna Paul Berg, married George Adler. And she died in childbirth in 1950. And I think George remarried after, shortly after that. And Petronella married uh, Matthias Gurner. And they lived in Marshfield for a while, but I haven't been able to follow up on her, what happened to her. Well, anyway, Mike builds the shop in 1887. All the boys start out working in the shop, but not all stay with them. The two that did were Nicholas Frederick and John Lewis Berg. Michael T. Berg Jr., we call them, worked in the shop for a while, but he and Leo ran uh, the Marshfield Times. What was it, the news One of them ended up working for the news later on. Well, they owned it during the First World War era. They were the. Then it wasn't the New Herald. New Herald didn't come until 24. Okay, so it had to be the Times. Yeah. Daily News? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Marshfield Herald? Marshfield Herald. Yeah. Yeah, they owned it during. These two owned that during the World War I period and had it for about three years. Martin, John Martin and John Lewis, same name. They called Martin, John Martin, Martin. He worked for consumers' store and so on, worked with different grocery stores. Rose married Frank Lucas and moved to Jefferson. William was a painter, house painter and interior decorator and so on. But John and John and Frederick, uh, Nicholas Frederick, John and Lewis and Nicholas Frederick took over the shop around about 1921. Now those handouts I gave you, uh, there was a handout back there that had a list of Mike Berg's uh, equipment in his blacksmith shop. Uh, and that, that dates from 19, his will was made out in 1921. And uh, you can see, you get a kind of an idea of what was what was in that shop. And right next to it was the woodworking shop. So John, in the gazetteers throughout, these guys are listed in the 20s as blacksmiths, all three of them. But later in the 20s, the gazetteer, the Wisconsin gazetteer lists Nick as a blacksmith and John as a wagon maker. So John in that will was, they willed, the family willed the equipment to John for woodworking and may, wagon making, and then the blacksmithing equipment went to Nick. Now, Mike, I'll, as long as we got the picture here, I'll, I'll go ahead with this. Uh, Mike retired around 1924. He was born in 1849. He retired around 1924. So he's around 73, 74, 75 years old when he retired. And then from 1921 to 24, he was active, but not I mean, he was there and doing things, but he wasn't. John and Nick were basically running the shop in the 20s. And then Mike died in June of 1927. Uh, he had gone down to live with Rose and Frank and Jefferson. He died down there and was brought back for uh, burial here. Hannah, Johanna died in 1925. And uh, so, and Leo died in 1920 from a burst appendix. So out of these children and the four daughters that he had in Kansas. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and four, he had 11 children. Uh, three of them died fairly young. Uh, but anyway, um, Mike died in 1927. And, and by that time, the gazetteer lists Berg Brothers Manufacturing Company with John and Nick as blacksmiths and wagon makers. And they ran like that until 1928. I don't know what, but they split. And so Berg Brothers was defunct in 1928. Nick kept the 1887 shop, this shop that you, that you saw a picture of earlier. And John came up and there was a shop across from Scotty's where the police station is right now. And he put up a woodworking shop there. And he went from wagon making to general cabinet making and so on. And then he also started building some of the first uh, frame bodies for Fisher Body in Detroit for early semi-trailer trailers. 
and he was shipping out, my dad said that he was shipping out, he had 10 guys working for him in the uh, late twenties before the depression, before the 29 crash. And he was banking a thousand dollars a week, shipping these oak frame bodies out on the railroad. And then of course, in, uh, during the depression, Nick was able to weather the depression, John, made some poor stock market investments. And he also had some, uh, he had borrowed some money to buy wood from his cousin, Nick Beck. And uh, he called the debt in and that triggered everything. And John lost his shop in the sheriff's sale in 1934 and went to City Point and taught woodworking and blacksmithing at the CCC camp in City Point until 42 and then he came back to Marshfield in 42 and worked for Rodis and died of a heart attack in June of 43. Uh, Nick kept the shop on, I, I think you could go on Don, here I can, yeah, I'll go back to that. I'm gonna tell these stories and then I'll come back to this. Nick kept the shop on Central Avenue until 1941 and the family actually had owned the property that was in the will that that went to the family. And so the family decided to sell it, to sell it to A.G. Sanders in 41. And Nick moved out here on Highway 97 out by uh, C. Hafer's Corners. And he put up a small, he bought a farm with a small shop or a building for a shop and he did blacksmithing. He died on December 8th, 1952, which is the same day in 1883, December 8th, 1883, that his dad bought the shop from John Hafer. Um, Martin and Peter lived until 1973. They were born in 1881 and 1882. And they lived until 1973 in Marshfield. Uh, Michael lived until 1960s, late 60s. And Leo, of course, died of appendicitis in 1920. So that was kind of the demise of the bird family. Okay. Again, just another picture of the Shop that was built in September 1887, and Sanders raised it in 1943, and that's when the brick, the brick, the brick building that's there now built shortly thereafter, and that was okay. I know it was leaf furniture and then mittens. What was it before Sanders? It was Schumer's paint store. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Ag Sanders bought it from. Ag Sanders bought this from the Bird. And that's that's where that building is. That's where the Alexia, that's where that yeah. Well, Sanders used to own that building right there on the corner by Chevy Bay. Yes, he had that one too. And he owned a number of yeah. I mean the Heisen Printing was owned by AJ Sanders at one time too, or AG Sanders. AG Sanders, yeah. yeah. We'll have to talk about that one. Yeah. So that's the this is just the background that I gave on that. Um about the family and, and everything. Uh so I think we can move on from there. Here's a picture of, uh, now again, this is that similar corner here in 1920, a little bit closer. Here's the shop right here. Here's Miner's shop that sits there right now. Here's Connor's office building. What street is that on that crosses Central? That would be fifth, right? And yeah, up on the Connor store, it's the fourth. This is fourth right up here, and then the crossing down here would be fifth. Okay. So you're looking from Fifth Street and Central. What? Well, that's a speed bump. Yeah. <laughs> That'll rip your oil pan out. What's the surface for Brick, I believe. Yeah. Gotta be. What year did you say this was? Well, I'm guessing 1920s, obviously. Yeah, so the street lights on. Yeah, and yeah. that's gotta be brick. Yeah. You can see the lines. Yeah, you can see some of the striations of brick. Now, um, this one, Shelby, I think I got this from you because I was doing this. I, I think this is your photograph. Thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> This is an aerial photograph that shows the whole downtown of Marshfield. But what I do is I focus in on it. And this is a 1940s era. And here you can see Walt Miner's building. You can see Mike Berg's blacksmith shop. There's that party wall. Now the woodworking shop, that part was sold by the family. And you've got the building that's in there now, right next to the Alexia. And I forget what that is. Is that the, is that the naughty store? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'll get a phone call on that. 
Um, and then this is where the uh, bookstore shop was, which is now what the, the martial arts is that yeah, it's yeah. in there. And then this is Connor's building. And this is where the bank is. Uh, here's the Adler. And I believe the monument shop is right down in here. Right there. There. And then Joe Goldbach's shop would be back over here and Jersey's would be back over here. It's wonderful to see some of the, I mean, just to have a couple of these to see what that transition of the city looked like. 1940s, I don't know when, but it's a 40s era photograph, judging from the automobiles. Yeah, that's the AP store. And no, that's gotta be, he said that was, AP isn't in here. And AP, AP was put in in 1941, just south of the Connor building. Oh, right here. Yeah, and okay. you got a minor peel here, but you don't have the A and P store, so it's before nineteen forty-one. Okay, so it might be a thirty or forty, nineteen forty. It didn't affect the thirties cars. Yeah. So I may have to backdate that a little bit more. I didn't have a date on it, so I'm just judging that those were. But I mean, it's just fun to look at that and see, you know, like we've got the 1890s and so on, and then you've got the 1912, and now you've got 1940s, and just to see how that, it's amazing, because that sat on that site for what would that be? Uh, I figured that out, it was 50, what, 1887 to 1943 would be 56 years. And I would love to see what that looked like, you know, I just want to. Okay, Let's see what I, okay, now here's another shot. Here's, this is Walt Miner's building right here. This is Miner's building. Uh, the Connor building has been moved and this is Leith Furniture. And this is where the Alexia nightclub is now. And here's that other block brick building that was where the wood shop used to be, the bake shop there. And this is a, what, a 60s, mm -hmm. early 60s. There's yeah, the Adler. Up there. Okay, so you're looking at a 60s vintage here. I think I can see the front of my store up there beyond that area. Yep. Yep. There. There. Yeah. Right there. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Okay. Now here's another shot of, okay, here's where the shop sat. This was where the woodworking shop sat. And of course, back in that 1930s picture, you see this building in there. You see Walt Miner's 1920 building. Do I know who built it? Uh, no, I've got the, I've got the, uh, I did a lot of work in the courthouse down in Rapids. So I have the document, the uh, deed and everything for this and, and the party wall agreement itself. I think what we'd have to do is go back and look at the newspapers and see. Well, do you know if it was a crazy building? They think it is. They, they didn't have documentation of it, but it's one of the buildings that she said looks like something that's crazy. Building. There's a big building I've seen in town once. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the problem. I, I think there's a lot of this fella is Ray Jersley. Uh, at the time of this picture, he was uh, 82 in 1992. Uh, and uh, I had interviewed him. He was one of the last blacksmiths in Marshfield. And uh, they bought the shop over just north of uh, where on the corner of Fourth and the alley there. What, what is in there now? Uh, now it's the escape room. Yeah, the escape room. That was the building that he said was where the shop sat, where the escape room is. And of course, uh, he's the son of John Jersley, brother, John's a brother of uh, Herb and uh, Lewis. And uh, Herb left for California before 26, but they bought that from Fred Jones, uh, the blacksmith shop. And Fred Jones uh, shows up in the gazetteer as a blacksmith around 1900, 1905. And they sometime between 1904 and 1912. And then Ray worked uh, in the shop in 1926. He bought out Lewis in 1930, married Leon Gershbach uh, in 1930. And then he shut the shop down in 1946 and went to work for the city of Marshfield. Worked for the city for a long time, so did his relatives. Nice man. We, had, we spent an afternoon together. Wanted a photograph, but he didn't have any. So. Hoping we'd have one, but was it a Jersey shop? Yeah, yeah, 
And so that's right up here. This is Fred Jones blacksmith shop that was built around 1900 or so and Jersey bought it around 04. This was in June of 04. And in this map, uh, gold block shop is not in the alley? No, no, it's not in there yet. Okay. Was the last blacksmith? No, Joe Fleischman was. Uh, and I count Joe in because he's a major. I mean, we're going to get to him, but he's one of the last living blacksmiths in Marshfield. Why did you shut the shop down? Well, because at that time, the transition to automobiles and automotive shops, Walt Miner built that shop, you know, it was a big garage. And so, you, you know, after the war, things really shifted uh, as far as blacksmithing goes. Your because... attention, please. The library will be closing in 20 minutes. All of today's meeting room reservations are now expiring. If you're using one of our meeting rooms, please gather your things and exit the room. Okay. If you have materials you would like to borrow, please check them out now. The library will be closing in 20 minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, after the war, things really shifted because just the technology of automotive, you know, brought on by the war itself, there was very little need for blacksmiths. Now the equipment that they had, like an anvil and and the uh, uh, the vices, you know, everything, those were useful yet. But really, they use a forge. Now you had gas welding, electric welding, you know, all this technology is shifting, and there's the horse culture is basically dead unless you're in a very remote rural area. And in town, there really wasn't. This is where the shop was. There really wasn't much of a call for. It. So we shut her down, and I went to work for the city. Okay. This is Joe Fleischman, 1889 to 1974, master blacksmith and wheelwright. He lived down here at, at uh, Klondike Corners. Okay, down, go ahead. Um, he was born uh, to Bavarian immigrants who settled in Oshkosh, and they moved to a farm south of Marshfield in 1896. He acquired a partnership with blacksmith Phillips Wolf. Uh, Wolf dissolves the partnership in 1912, sells out to Joe. He acquired a blacksmith shop, sawmill, wheelwright shop, diversified into blacksmithing, wheelwright, uh, and as well as making uh, axe handles and cranberry rake handles. So a variety of things. August of 1913, he marries Anna Berhard from Oshkosh, uh, and they made their home above the blacksmith shop. I have to correct my spelling there. <laughs> Uh, August 6, 1937, the shop burns down and a new one was built. 47, a larger smith, uh, a brick blacksmith shop with a boiler and forge were built, and he took on plowshare work. And then 10 years, he made rims and forged and constructed the complete uh, wagon wheels for the circus world down at Baraboo. And that's where he had his. Yeah, I thought a lot of money under the counter. A lot of people employed that worked for them. Yeah, that was a big thing. That was a big thing. He had, a, he had a patent on a gas engine from 1910, and he was in, working on a stone picker invention. He had six sons, and uh, John worked with his father in the blacksmith shop uh, until 1964, and then he took uh, other trade work out of town. And on February 26, 1974, he was loading a set of wheels for Circus World. He had a heart attack and died. And that's the shop that was down on Klondike Corners. So the blacksmith shop was the back building or the front building? Uh, I think the blacksmith shop was up here, but I'm not sure. I mean, this is Joe here. Got his pipe. And, oh. yep. This is just a listing of all the uh, Wisconsin State Gazetteer listings for blacksmiths in Marshfield from 1895 through uh, the 1920s. And I also included Simon Flum, harness makers, and uh, who else did I have in there? Oh, Lang and Sharman and Keels. And then ones I forgot to put in were uh, Felker Brothers. Mm -hmm. I apologize to the Felker Brothers. They were 1908, I think, right? Okay. And up through 28. You can see here now, if you look at 21, 21, you got Berg Brothers. And 25 by 25, they're listed separately. And by 28, 27, they're listed separately. I think they split off in 28 because the land deed that John had for the shop over here. So. 
So uh, basically, the blacksmith obviously is a very important tradesperson, one of the first, as we talked about, uh, essential for just about everything involving iron and it could broaden out into different types of metal work also, some did, casting work, uh, so on. And uh, so to have these tradespeople in this little colonial colonizing settlement helped it thrive and, and prosper. So there we have it. That's the black blacksmiths and marsh. Oh, this is if you want to come over to see this uh, next, not this weekend, but next weekend, Clover Village in Clover uh, has their heritage village. They have a weekend heritage weekend, and I will be working the Smith shop over there. This is their this is an actual 1880 blacksmith shop. And I just do small projects here on forge welding and axe head. Uh, so if you want to come over, they have a great set of buildings from historic buildings moved on site, all re renovated and everything to their original appearance. Try the next one here. Is that Saturday or Sunday? Saturday and Sunday. And we're done. <laughs> Go ahead. That's my daughter took those pictures. So. <laughs> I think you gotta get out of yeah. Thank okay. You so yep. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Nita and Don, for rescuing me and saving my bacon. <laughs> thank you so much, John. That was wonderful. I loved the pictures that you had. Very nice. Thank you. So um, the next Spoken History will be um, July 14th, and the topic will be Wisconsin and the Civil Wars, and the speaker will be Tim Krause. Does anybody have any other questions for John? We've got to close up here in a few minutes, but um, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. 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 Thank you. yeah, thank you for coming out. Yes, I think he's in the gazetteer.